All right. All right. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into this. Black Panther, Wakanda forever. Man, this is crazy. Who would have thought that we actually would have been here? The last film of Marvel's Phase 4 filler arc. Holy shit. So there's a lot of opinions going around about this movie being one of, if not the most highly anticipated movie of Marvel's Phase 4 filler arc, except maybe Spider-Man, but we all know why that was the case. <laughs> it was relatively obvious with the sudden passing of Chadwick Boseman, therefore leaving the role of the Black Panther and T'Challa up in the air. And no matter what, it was going to be a hit or miss in all aspects when it came to the fandom. As Thanos said, I am inevitable. No matter the handling or the direction that Marvel was going to take the character of the Black Panther, the passing of T'Challa, and the movie's singular but also overarching narrative, this was always going to be the case. And with most of the trailers just pushing and tugging at the emotional strings and the aspects that the film was just going to have to overcome, I would have to say that this was the first Marvel Phase 4 product that I really didn't have an opinion on going into the film just strictly from the trailers. Which was pretty cool and refreshing because honestly, I liked Black Panther Wakanda forever. I thought it was good. Dare I say, a normal formulaic MCU film. Which unfortunately is something that obviously doesn't hit our theaters too often since this filler arc started, so it felt good. Alright, so this movie is new, like come on, it's less than a week old. So I'm not just going to get into the usual overcasting of summarizing the entire plot, which does sound weird kind of coming out of my mouth because of all of the terrible media that I've covered, I still did that for them. Which honestly feels disrespectful to this film because it actually did have a plot, so... Okay, wait, that's dumb. Here's a quickie. So after T'Challa lets the world know about Wakanda and Vibranium, the world, well, becomes the world. And obviously wants more and to use the Vibranium as a weapon for mass destruction, and will do anything to achieve that power, even if they have to raid Wakandan bases or find a different source. Not a great plan. Look at us in the MCU, truly taking it back to the roots Iron Man 1 style. Because of that, the Queen of Wakanda doesn't really mess with the people. Makes sense. People suck. But how would said people be able to achieve such a feat? Vibranium and Wakanda have been around since the development of human civilizations. Surely, if we haven't found another source since then, how do we hope to find some now? Enter into the chat, Riri Williams, a 19-year-old MIT student that happens to be, immediately, one of the smartest people in the MCU, and man sure do they let you know. Also, she is black, if you did not notice. The film also lets you know that. Who just happened to build a machine who can detect vibranium? Crazy. And no, she doesn't make this for the feds. They just use her technology. Regardless, the vibranium was going to be found. Little did the people know that it was going to be above an underwater city of Talokan, an Atlantis-like city that, while being deep in the ocean, was pretty beautiful, I'm not gonna lie. And that's when we meet the man. The myth. The legend himself. No more. What an absolute Johnson, a true carry of this film. Anyway, No More doesn't want the feds to know of his people's existence or to give up his vibranium. Again, makes sense. People suck. So what's the best plan of action? Right. To enlist the help of Wakanda, who happens to also hate the people and ensure the secrecy and basically the survival of their two nations. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what your personal point of view is, Namor is not a soft ass, with his plan of action to kill the scientist that made the vibranium detecting technology, and if not, then basically plans to wreak havoc on the entirety of the surface world for being so ass for the past millennia. Unfortunately, with the Wakandans managing to capture Riri before Namor of the feds, the cliche emotional bond has already formulated between Shuri and Riri. And with the Wakandans now on a different course of action that doesn't involve the murder of this 19-year-old, Namor has had enough and he's just like, nah, that's crazy. You're my enemies now. With the plot now laid out and in action, the rest of the film plays out just like any other formulaic Marvel film pre this Marvel Phase 4 filler arc. We get Namor's backstory, how he became to be, or... Actually, no. No. The how isn't important, not more than the why. So why Namor became this way and why his motivations reflect his past trauma. He got CGI fight scenes, emotional moments, not only involving T'Challa's character, but I would say the most emotional, like not really in sadness, but in pure acting and emotion on display were involving characters not named T'Challa. Imagine. But that's a good thing. Just like with Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield returning to play their respective Spider-Mans in No Way Home, Shuri becoming the new Black Panther wasn't really a kept secret. 
maybe they didn't want it to be, but who knows. All right, Shuri becomes the new Black Panther. She doesn't really beat Namor. I could honestly say the opposite, but fuck it. Shuri beats Namor. The two then form a pact to always aid each other and their nations, or maybe not. You know those open Marvel plot threads. We all say Wakanda forever, and we're out of there. End credits. Oh shit. Actually, never mind. T'Challa now has a son. God damn it, Marvel, and all these damn kids in this filler arc. They gotta have a problem. Anyway, after all of that, I thought this movie was good. I purposely left out, like, the mad important character moments or plot threads just in case you haven't seen the movie yet, or more importantly so I can touch on all of those things now. Because while I said I liked this movie and this movie was good and formulaic and while I appreciated that, that doesn't mean it goes without slander. So let's get into that. I mean making slanderous accusations. Okay, main thing. I don't understand why Namor immediately turns on Wakanda just because they don't agree with him outright killing Riri. Honestly, this is another form of comedy when it comes to Marvel. I remember even turning to my brother and being like, oh, well, that was a big shift. I would even understand if they didn't really have any real solutions that Namor could just look at and go along with, but we did. It made perfect sense for Wakanda and Namor to just hide Riri and Wakanda. This is Wakanda. One, people just aren't going to openly attack the nation of Wakanda no matter how dumb the government is. They'll just get wiped. Even then, if Namor wanted to go through the whole I'm going to wipe out the surface world because they've been terrible, I don't think Queen Rwanda was going to stop that. This is where I think the first real debate I've seen stem from this film. Would Wakanda have stopped Namor from attacking the surface world if they could have just kept Riri alive in Wakanda? Let's keep it straight. From the first act of this film, it truly feels like Queen Rwanda was done with the government and the world and was just truly down to go back and reside in Wakanda and call it a day. The only true conflict was with killing Riri. It's a very interesting dilemma to have because both of the characters have very valid points. From Namor's POV, why protect a random kid if you're just going to let me go wipe the entire surface world and vice versa from the POV of Queen Rwanda? Obviously, we needed the movie to happen, so therefore the events just played out the way they did. I just wish that we took a little bit more time or effort or grace to think about a more natural way to display that conflict. Now, while that might have been the main talking point stimulating from this film, I guess besides Chadwick, obviously, that wasn't really my main problem. And I guess I feel like this is something that could be completely overlooked, but nah, I can't. With the technology in Wakanda, it truly feels like we have no stakes. I understand and I kind of agree that the bridge fight was one of, if not the best fight in the film. But come on, yo. We made Michonne into a predator. Like, what is this? What is this? I'm asking you right now on your screen. This isn't rhetorical. What is this? What is going on? Then, like, if Michonne can just become an Iron Man predator hybrid, What's even the point of other heroes? This suit and the power scaling of said suit already makes you more powerful than characters in the Guardians of the Galaxy, Bucky, all Earthbound heroes like true humans, not people like Shang-Chi or Wanda, but you get my point. It just seems mad unnecessary, but it also shows the direction that Marvel is heading in with more powerful antagonists coming up in our future, and I just hope it doesn't become too cartoony if that makes sense. Because as Syndrome said all those years ago, so that everyone can be superheroes. Everyone can be super. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. Man, I hope they add him into the MCU. Maybe like a what if or something like that. That would be funny. He can be a clown, just like Riri Williams' Iron Man suit design. God, that shit is ugly. Now, before we get to the main course, we gotta touch on Queen Rwanda. Man, what a character and what a performance. She's great and is very relatable. Her speech to Michonne when she was stripping her of her rank, I was like, holy shit, I feel this. And she wasn't even being overly emotional and making a poor decision. She was speaking facts, including her dialogue with Namor. I was like, man, this is actually what it would be like if two heads of their nations were actually talking and negotiating, but actually respected each other. No backstabbing, no scheming. It's like, man, this is the opposite of Game of Thrones. We don't really get that a lot in movies nowadays, let alone in the real world. That's crazy. Which makes it even more disappointing when Namor killed her because it seemed so underwhelming. Like, 
No last words, no patching or mending of broken relationships, no passing of the torch. Just run child. It was a true bummer, and honestly, I didn't expect her to die, not because it would be the cliche thing to do, but more because it was simply so underwhelming that it just didn't feel right to do her character or her performance justice. But now, hmm. Oh yes sir, let's talk about my boy Namor. What an absolute legend. A Johnson, if you will. Besides his dumbass plot twist in order to make the movie happen, Namor was that dude. And I'm not even going to try, I can't disrespect the man like that, but Tanakh does fantastic in this role, and I'm absolutely excited to see more of this dude. Unlike Killmonger, to throw in a full-on backstory, well, origin story, in the middle of a film tackling the loss of Chadwick is a heavy task, but they managed to pull it off somehow. And don't get me wrong, I'm seeing a lot of, oh, Namor's not a villain, he's an anti-hero or an antagonist, but definitely not a villain, and it's like, Let's relax on that narrative, mates. The man was sending his generals on missions to kill innocent people for just doing their jobs. Definitely a villain. And while his charted path and course of action might have changed in the ending of the film, through the duration, Namor was a villain for sure. Which at the end of the day, isn't bad. It makes sense. His backstory was tragic. I couldn't imagine actually living in a time of slavery. It's mad cringe. The only thing we didn't explain when it comes to Namor's character are these. Like, bro, what are these? Why are you the only ones that have these wings? Why are they so OP? Man was flying and gliding in the air like he was Aang from Avatar. I'm joking. Well, not really. But with that being besides the point, as I said in the beginning, Namor was an awesome character and definitely hit this movie with a hard care. When it comes to characters like Shuri and Riri, I feel as if it's premature to make any form of an assessment on their new upgrades in regards to them being now super people. Riri was really, really rushed because of the heavy focus on Namor's character and Shuri became Black Panther in what, the last 10 to 15 minutes of the movie? And so I feel like it would be a disservice to judge their characters now without any time to flesh out their new characters with their new power-ups. But I will say that I wasn't really excited for Ironheart, and while I'm still not really overwhelmed by the idea, I did at least enjoy Dominique Thorne's performance. Overall, I would say Black Panther Wakanda Forever was a top-tier MCU Phase 4 filler arc product. That is still a mouthful. Which I know, everybody says, oh well, that's not really saying much, and that's not really the case. Just because the majority of the products that have been released in this filler arc are shit, doesn't mean Wakanda Forever is just better shit. Because it's not, and honestly, it's disrespectful to even think that this film shares in the same shadow realm as films like Black Widow, The Eternals, or Doctor Strange Mom. We call it Doctor Strange Mom. Like, those are true, true turds. And this isn't. And while I'm not going as far as to say that this was the best sequel film in the MCU on the hierarchy of the Winter Soldier, we gotta relax on that, mates. Like, go rewatch that film and come back to me. I still thoroughly enjoyed myself while watching Wakanda Forever, and I'm excited to see the future installments of these characters. It only feels right to end this off with a Wakanda Forever and a rest in peace to the man Chadwick Boseman. What a legend. Thank you guys for watching the video, and if you enjoyed, make sure to do all of that YouTube stuff, like leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, and definitely 100% leave your comments down below on Wakanda Forever, and well, this entire Phase 4 Marvel filler arc as a whole, we're done now. Imagine, we're done with all the shit. So let's talk about it. Otherwise, that's all the words I got for you today. Bye.